Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today on the second session of Environment is the Key to Recovery-Oriented Transformation. Our first session was um, took place last week on the 22nd, and today we have Remy joining us again. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, this is to acknowledge that this presentation was prepared for the New England MHTTC. At this time of this presentation, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman served as the SAMHSA Assistant Secretary, and the opinions expressed um, are the views of the moderator and panelists and do not reflect uh, the opinions of SAMHSA. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And just some housekeeping information, your microphone is currently muted um, during the Q&A portion of today's session. Uh, we will unmute microphones so that people can voice their questions out loud or you can use the chat, either way it works. Um, and if you do have any questions or technical difficulties, please uh, let us know in the chat and I can assist you today. I'll be the tech lead today. This session is being recorded and it will be posted on our website tomorrow. And if you do have any questions, you can always email us. Um, I'll put that information in the chat as well. Um, and this is just to remind you that the MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all of our activities. We hope that you can join us in that um, to use strengths-based and hopeful language, person first, free of labels. Um, again, um, yeah. So if you do have any questions, let us know in the chat. Otherwise, I'll pass it off to Grazi. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to introduce to you my colleague and dear friend, Remy. Remy is uh, a chief of Mental Health Connecticut and she will be talking today with us. Remy, I would like to thank you and I also would like to thank Mental Health Connecticut and I hope you enjoy this presentation as much as I am, so Great. thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Graziella. It's wonderful to be here. And I wanted to say good afternoon to everyone. Um, for those of you who joined us last week, it's great to see you again. And for those of you who are coming in new today, I'll be going through just a brief recap to kind of help put it in frame for you. And we'll move forward, okay? Um, I'll be checking the chat periodically to make sure and see if anybody has any questions. And it's um, also, if you happen to raise your hand, um, I'm sure they could unmute you momentarily and we could take your question like that as well. So anyway, good afternoon, everybody. This is um, the second part to talking about creating an environment at work that um, really utilizes day to day and kind of begins to live and breathe person-centered planning. So we're gonna continue setting the stage about and talking about recovery-oriented and person-centered planning, okay? And what we began the last time we met was really talking about the beginning of establishing that environment. And what we'll do is I'm gonna do a brief recap now, and then we'll walk through the rest of it. So hope you enjoy. Okay, so let's recap for those who are just joining us today. Um, you know, we talked about the person-centered principles last week, and just in a nutshell, Person-centered principles, we've decided there's no common one definition, but there are, all, are several themes, benchmarks, or principles, if you will, that really help people understand what that is. One of this is a relationship between the person who's getting the services and the practitioner. And um, basically, it's adult-to-adult, -adult, common, respectful um, interaction. And the person that is receiving the services is in the center. Um, they are right along with you in full collaboration, okay? The other thing about the, the principles to pay attention to is that they really see the person not just around what are their needs, you know, as a consumer of services, if you will, but really incorporating every area of that person's life and knowing that the whole person, all the way from, you know, spiritual, mental, physical health, what are their, their likes, what do they believe in, what are their values? It just looks at that whole person. Um, the other principle is that we, we go through this practice and this time with people really focusing on what their strengths are. And let me tell you just a little bit why. When we look at all of ourselves, right, we all have natural strengths, talents, and they stem from early interest or things that really 
uh, grabbed our attention when we were younger. And the more attention we paid to something we liked, we would practice it, or even if it were putting together model airplanes or blocks, the more we practice that and we're doing it because we like it, our neural pathways begin to get carved out in that area. Those become those natural strengths and talents and passions that we have as we move into you know, our older years. Um, so we wanna look at pulling those out of people instead of spending our time shoving into someone maybe something that they will just naturally like. I mean, they won't naturally like or really enjoy. It doesn't mean that we don't want people to manage things, but let's take time pulling those natural talents and strengths out of somebody, okay? That, and I'll tell you, that's hard enough. I'm sure people that have, um, you know, working in this field could tell you. So really important principle to really be working on people's strengths. Okay. The other thing is taking responsibility or looking at and recognizing that we're responsible for risk taking as a necessary, and it's responsible risk taking as really necessary to someone's growth and recovery, right? All of us have tried things and, and failed and we try again and they may work. Um, we've all been told, oh, be careful, don't do that. And maybe have tried it and the outcome wasn't that wonderful, but people have the right to try, right? And we call that responsible risk taking. So, and again, just really making sure that we're really acknowledging um, people's strengths and their values and what's very meaningful to them. So um, we talked a little bit last week about barriers and some of them really have to do with the competition between what we do with somebody and having to fulfill certain documentation um, procedures or guidelines or benchmarks, if you will. Um, and that, you know, a lot of people that we serve um, may be uh, um, recipients of Medicaid. And of course there's your own mandates, plus whoever you're, um, whoever's accredited you might ask for certain types of documentation and really looking at and focusing on how do we meld the real work that we're doing that we want to describe with what's going to meet like mandates that guide us fiscally or um, even contractually. Um, the other part we were talking about too was, you know, so where do you begin with this, right? So we spent a lot of time last week really looking at the launching, um, talking about the fact that leadership, we want, you know, has to be part of the system of values. This is all value guided, right? But not just leadership too, people that are really doing the work. Um, the way we presented them needs to be in a way that not, not they fully understand, but they're also giving them the resources and the tools they need, and that they're seeing this as not just more work to do, or another topic du jour, or what have you. I mean, this is person-centered recovery center planning. It's where our work needs to live, right? Not only in what we do, but also in our hearts. And so it's important that it's not only leadership, but also focused with um, the people that are doing the work every day. And you know, we need to start out by setting the stage. In order to do that, you need to take a look at, around at your work environment and look, um, asking yourself questions like, well, where are we at with this? Have we never practiced it before? Have we introduced it and spent a ton of time training people? And then it kind of died out over the past couple of years, so on and so forth. So I had shared um, some assessment tools that you can use to identify some of that um, last week. So. Moving on with that, we kind of set the stage, looked at finding out where you're at, where you're starting from. And today we're gonna to carry forward with that. So, you know, here we are, we have set the stage. We've decided that we are going to really kind of live this and make sure it becomes part of our culture. So where do we begin? Okay. Well, I always, when people ask me, I say, well, it kind of begins at the beginning. It begins before we even start to do the service. And we all know that right now we work with um, a lot of people that we're already working with, obviously are doing this work. But I look back to the very beginning, right? And if there were a blank slate and moving forward, we have to look at recruitment, okay? Number one, the thing I'm looking at is what's the language? What is it with messaging that we're putting out there when we're posting positions that need to be filled? I mean, of course, what's put out there has to be in line with what the position responsibilities are. But when someone's looking to work for our organization and they're looking at our postings, what are they gleaning from those? 
Do they get any sense of our system of values and what's important to our organization? With the thought being that we ought to be putting language out there. It's telling people, you know, we're working with, with people that we're served. This is an adult to adult relationship that we have here. Um, the person is the center of everything, that they have the right to guide their services, that it's completely, it's, it, it needs to be collaborative. And are we letting people know that up front before they're even applying? So again, what are our postings saying? Um, what are we calling our positions and how are we describing them it, with our use of language, right? So past the recruitment phase, let's roll into what else is important. The second thing we need to look at is in our job descriptions. Now, I know that we don't always or aren't always um, able to control or give input into what those job descriptions say, but when at all possible, relating to the human resources, sorry, the human resources department would be important because if we're gonna be rolling this out and it's, we're putting training, we're putting resources into it and we really wanna support it, we have to make sure that people know that that's kind of a competency or essential skill right up front. That number one, these are our values. And number two is, you know, we're gonna give you a lot of support around this, but the expectation is that you will show that you're utilizing these person-centered and recovery-centered skills in the work that you do. So some language it would be very useful for language such as that to be sitting right in the job description. So people are clear up front. You know, messaging needs to start right away. And that is in our ads all the way through job descriptions, right? Great beginning if we can get that down pat. Another thing that we want to pay attention to is interview processes. And we, a lot of us might have human resources departments that do the preliminary screening. So let's share that with them, but also um, directors or managers who are gonna be doing interviews, right? Couple things to think about. Um, during our interviews, what are the types of questions that we can ask or scenarios that we can have people respond to that are gonna really pull out um, what, what that person's values are, you know, what do they think, what is recovery to them? What does that look like, right? How hopeful are they at, or at all about people in recovery and, and, and how that happens and what it looks like, looks like, and if it's possible, you know, these are things we really wanna know, what peop know about people. You know, we could teach technical skills all day, every day, and people can learn the technical pieces of it. But what we can't really teach people or change, right? Or what people's beliefs are. Yes, education helps, but truly what do they think? Do they think people have the ability to, um, to really live fruitful, productive lives? Do they have the ability to change and grow? We wanna know that up front before we're bringing somebody in and training them on the technical parts of this, right? Again, what do they expect the outcomes of our work to be, right? What do they see? in the position they're interviewing for, what do they see the role? You know, after you've described and they've read the job description and you've given them some backgrounds, after, please be checking in on, so, you know, given the information I've shared with you so far, in quotes, you know, so how are you seeing this role? Can you describe to me, you know, what this role is going to be like? And really um, paying attention and being curious as to what that person understands this work to be, so important. Um, again, and, and scenarios, I usually get some scenarios from staff who've really lived these examples I'm going to ask people to respond to, you know, have them respond either verbally or in a written form to scenarios that may help you see what are their values, what is their level, if you will, of like emotional intelligence or critical thinking, right, and what their talents and their passions are. Um, this is all information we've really wanna make sure that we're understanding um, with the candidate or about the candidate. So, excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue on a bit here. So after we've done you know, our, our recruitment and I'm sorry, our, our job postings and our recruitment, and we're looking for the items that we spoke about, you know, next comes, okay, so we make a decision that we think we want to bring this person in and on board. What can we do during 
our onboarding or training or orientation sessions with people that further solidifies the efforts we're making to do this person-centered recovery centered living and breathing kind of culture in our organizations. Um, I know one of the things, and, and this is different for every organization, but folks that come on board with MHC, the first week they, they go through an orientation and that's all the way from policy, getting their higher paperwork done, policies and procedures, agency values and what have you. Right up front within that first week of coming on board, we go through what are the values of our organization. Um, and we make sure that they understand them, they have um, an opportunity to ask questions and that we remain curious with them too around, you know, if we say the values of our organization are, for instance, trust, respect, accountability, support, and resources, okay? Let them tell you what they think they mean. Right. We really want to understand people, hit people right at the door with, look, this is the way that we operate and we live and breathe these. They're not some beautiful words posted in a picture on the wall in your agency that are lit up from above. These are things that we're really doing. So you want people to understand that from the get go. Um, again, check in with them on what they think their role is about. What is the role they're playing with the people we serve? Right, really good time to, again, if there's any misperceptions or misunderstanding, to really help correct those um, way up front. So there's no surprises, right, as we move forward. Okay, another piece that we really, really wanna pay attention to is um, in practice. So they're now on, you know, they're now working, they've gone through the onboarding process. We're, we're starting to train them, literally, you know, skills and the guidelines and kind of benchmarks of person-centered and recovery-centered planning. So in practice, what are we going to do and what can we do to help people really understand what this work is all about? Okay, number one is of course training. Um, teaching and helping people understand and really work in a person-centered way isn't something somebody's gonna learn overnight. You know, it's important as we're training them about the, the guiding principles, of person-centered planning that um, number one is we're mixing that also with allowing them time to also meet the program participants and start getting comfortable. So again, it's not putting them back to book practice only. You know, a lot of folks come with us with, um, come to us with experience. Some of them don't, some of them have the education but haven't done a lot of work. So let's start helping them get used to kind of what that feels like. So as they're learning the skills, it's in a, they have a frame of reference, if you will, about how it would look when they were really spending time with people. So of course we wanna do the training and have a very um, organized system of what pieces of it we're teaching them up front um, and what follows. So people are building upon and really kind of understanding what this work is, okay? And what, what it means and what it looks like, but also, um, I always say within 30 days, if they're, you're hitting them with the values up front to help them understand it, start doing your first pieces of training within 30 days, making sure that person's also meeting the participants so they can start learning, incorporating that also so they can start the all important engagement process as well. You know, really getting to know people and starting to form that trusting relationship. Um, of course, our training is gonna be based around the principles of person-centered planning. Um, we all know that listening skills in terms of engagement are A number one. So um, really going through and making sure that we're doing work around people on compassionate, active listening, rather than kind of passive listening or selective listening, maybe going through and incorporating the ORs right away up front, which of course the O's, or sorry, are an acronym and often used in motivational interviewing as O being open-ended questions, A being affirmations, R being reflecting back to that person, what you think you're hearing, and also the affect you, you might be um, experiencing coming from them. And S, which is a really nice summarizing of what you think they're, they're trying to say. So great checking in time that really allows a person and the employee not only that, but the people we serve when we use it, to know that we're really there 
present with them in the moment and really care enough to, to stay curious and make sure we understand them, right? So you want to be teaching all of this again, and I'll return back to while that employee is also starting to meet um, not only their colleagues um, and get familiar with the office and whatnot, but really starting to meet the people that we're working with every day. Um, having done a lot of PCP training in our organization, I can tell you that, um, again, you do have to do the dry stuff and the principles, but whenever you can use role-playing scenarios. Um, I watch, um, have staff watch uh, many, many videos that are not only interviewing clinicians that have used this work. Um, I've shown them samples of good use of listening skills and that motivational interviewing piece and people that um, have had experience um, working with people in this person-centered way. So they get a bit of everything. Um, and then tons of role playing, um, doing group exercises uh, with, where their peers are giving them feedback um, in small groups. So really making sure it's, it's super robust because if they're just learning principles, they can regurgitate those and, and understand the principles. But what does it look like when you're doing it, right? If we had a camera going and someone was, was really standing with those values and being person-centered, um, with an individual and you recorded them over a month, right? What would that look like? You know, people need role models. Some of this stuff is brand new to people. And again, I always like that peer feedback piece because if they're all learning it together and you're doing small group exercises, I always make sure that, you know, everybody gets a chance to practice, but I always have one person who is being the, um, the staff member, if you will, the other person who's being the service recipient, and then somebody who's hanging back as the observer, right? That can really watch the interactions and everybody should get a chance to play all three of those roles. One, so we know what it feels like um, to practice some of our person-centered values and understanding, right? We should be the service recipient so we can kind of stand in their shoes, say, hey, what does this feel like, right? What does it feel like when it's like kind of spot on? What does it feel like when someone's struggling with it a little bit, right? And also to be able to relax and really watch all of this taking place as kind of a third party is just um, as strong a learning experience. So to really, really mix it up. Um, and this is ongoing. As we know, you can't load it all up front. It takes time. People need to take bits of this back with them into their work and really start feeling or experiencing what it feels like and start to also recognize, hmm, how do things go when I think I'm really practicing this and I'm kind of spot on with it? What, what's that feeling like for me? What kind of response am I getting from the program participant? And then also get the experience to know what it's like when maybe you miss some opportunities there and weren't you know, as centered around this kind of um, work. What does that feel like too? And what kind of responses am I getting from the program participant when that happens? This is something that we really live out and experience, okay? And it takes time, okay. So we start doing the training, you know, people are really aware of what the principles are, what our values are as an organization. We're now starting to train. Uh, people are knowing the real kind of value-based technical stuff. They're also getting chance to practices and have some experience with it during training. Now they're starting to apply it in their work every day, right? Um, how do we keep it alive? We all have lived through, um, and especially those who have been um, in this field for a while, we, we've lived through many different kinds of initiatives because as people study this work, right? And the great work, of course, of Yale and Janice Tandura and Larry Davidson. I mean, I could go on and on about their work. It's amazing. But as we're learning all of this, um, how do we keep it alive? I mean, it's a practice. And I've seen some wonderful initiatives come out super strong and all kinds of resources are put behind them. And then competing agendas start and um, there's some new research and other best practices are being thrown our way, you know, with the intent of us just having better and better resources. But how do we keep what we've learned alive? Because if it stays alive, it becomes part of the culture, right? 
And when it becomes part of the culture of what we do, it becomes much more natural, right? And uh, much more fluid. Um, so how do we make sure it's staying that way in a world with so many you know, different competing agendas? So um, I know and wanna share some things that we've done and lessons we've learned about sustainability and how to really keep it living and breathing in the work that you're doing, right? So um, let me just pull all of these up and then we'll, um, we'll talk about them. Okay, there should be one more. Okay. So one of the things that we did now, um, pretend that the cohort of folks that you have on board right now on staff are, suppose they've been here now for a year. I'm sure you have had people that have been here longer and people who have not been here um, but a few months. So, but keeping it sustainable is practice sessions and exercises. So once you've, um, people have gone through all of the kind of carved out, not even mandated, but trainings that, that have been there and all of the offerings, if you will, um, it doesn't end there. How do we keep it alive? One is practice sessions and exercises, right? Let's look at what are the natural and resources we already have to be able to do it, to be able to do those practice, practice sessions and small group exercises, right? Do you wanna do them, um, have a set of these sessions, one, one, some which are practiced by leadership and the supervisors, right? So we can keep it alive there on that level and keep it fresh with them, right? Then we could leave them with quote unquote homework, if you will, to then take back to their groups or their teams, right? Look at times that you naturally meet as a team, right? During weekly meetings, what have you. Um, anything that you have preset, that way you're not creating an, yet another meeting, right? Using those meetings to say, okay, let's go, let's do some exercises here. Let's refresh on um, part A of this, right? Let's, let's do an exercise where for the next week, we're gonna all watch, um, we're gonna watch the amount that we, the amount of time that we've spent or how well we ourselves are doing with using that all those person-centered principles. And we're gonna look at, hey, when did we do well? When did we do not so well, right? If we missed an opportunity or uh, didn't bring forth maybe our best selves, what, what, what was up, right? What happened there? Were we tired? Were we walking into our time with someone maybe feeling a bit depleted or in reaction about something? So really giving people the opportunity to, to really be practicing this um, because it is, it's a practice, right? And people are gonna get it and they're not gonna get it and they're gonna forget. I mean, this is all part of being human, right? And what we go through in our work every day. So it's really important that we do, we're keeping it alive and front and center using again, your team meetings, one-to-one um, -one time, you guys could call it supervision, staff development time, you know, whatever you name it. When, if it's sitting in, if it's sitting in a job description, right? Which is part of the accountability, which we'll talk about later. Let's make sure that in our one-to-one -one time with staff, we're checking in and seeing how it's doing, right? So you can use leadership meetings, supervisory meetings, staff meetings, and you could be doing it with all three. I know that I take about, depending on the length of the meeting, I usually have um, this practice sitting as a standing agenda item in the meetings so we can at least have 15 to 20 minutes to really practice. Um, so again, you don't have to create new meetings for it, but give it time during existing meetings. Really, really important. Um, and again, what other resources does your agency have to keep this really front and center? Is there um, you know, email blasts about certain things? Can we create little staff, um, what do we call them? Like uh, fact checks we can send out to people asking one question a week or to ask or give somebody a um, or give our staff a little challenge of the week that maybe has to do with something around person-centered practice. Anything to keep this like alive and breathing and making it a natural part of what sits with us every day in our work. Um, do we have an agency newsletter or something that goes out? I know that the, we, we've used that, which is really great. We can do like a little corner of you know, whatever you want to call it, person-centered planning uh, corner. We can give kudos or awards away. 
We can tell people what's new, what's going on. What are the new upcoming trainings we might be having? Um, stories of success. Um, stories where people are um, maybe sharing a part of this that seems to be a common struggle for people, right? And putting it out there for discussion. So many, many different ways to really focus in on the sustainability once we've start to kind of really either breathe new life into a person-centered practice or begin using it. You know, everybody's kind of at a different stage here. Okay, so accountability. We have put out ads that start to mention what is important to us and our values. It's on the job description. We've checked in with staff around, you know, do you really understand this? What does it mean to you, right? How do you operationally kind of define what it is we're saying here? We're doing all that. After we've offered the trainings and retrainings, we've then taken it and we've kept it front and center and we're giving these you know, fact checks and going over it during meetings and giving little challenges here and there, right? How do we know it's working? And I use the word accountability. I'd love to erase that because there's kind of a negative connotation there, but what that really means is, is this working? Is it working? Non-judgmentally, we need to check in and we need to see how things are going, right? So how do you do that? And I go back to the time we spend with staff in development. And you know, I know that in that in itself is a challenge. When we look at um, time that supervisors spend with staff in a one-to-one -one setting, what ends up happening is some of it is, or a large part of it is, oh my gosh, what's going on in the present moment? You know, are there fires we need to put out? Um, it may be very, very centered and, you know, rightfully so on things that are right at hand in front of us, right? Someone's in crisis, we need to come up with, um, you know, some other interventions we may need to be doing with them. You know, we have lots of competing agendas that could eat that time up. Let's make sure, especially if we use a template for our time with people with leading questions, um, let's make sure that that sits on that staff development sheet or form. So as supervisors, you're triggered to remember to check in on it. You know, even during our staff time, can how, we're, how we are doing, you know, or how are you doing, can be sitting as a staff, like a um, just be blocked out and sitting as a standing agenda item in most of our meetings. That's so helpful um, because again, we have a lot of other things competing for, with our time and attention. So when we're doing our one-to-one -one time, can we talk to people about, hey, how are you doing with this? You know, this is what I've seen or feedback I've heard or things you've shared with me. You know, I can see that this part of this is working out really well for you. Tell me about that, right? What have you been doing that's working? and really get to know that and making sure they're sharing that with their peers, right? Just as important, where are you tripping up? Like, you know, where are the areas? What are the barriers? Um, what's going on where you may not be utilizing this to the best of your ability? Is it a retraining situation? Is it a discussion? Um, is that person not feeling comfortable using part of it and why, right? We can help people and help support people in their success if, if we don't remain curious about why something's going well, right? As well as why something isn't going so well, like any other skill, but we need to do that consistently. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, are people going to the trainings that are being offered? Are they attending them um, the way they should be? Are they attending them consistently? Or are they logging on and 20 minutes later, you see them logging off? Um, you know, and what is it about that? If they're not, let's be curious about why that is, right? There could be many reasons we would never think about that may be uh, where their performance or what have you would be improved if we knew about that, right? Um, looking at every, um, every possible moment that is pre-existing to be offering refreshers. Um, they don't have to be, you know, in this day and age, obviously, um, they don't have to be in person. They could be through Teams or Zoom or whatever platform that you do, that you use. Um, homework could be loaded into the chat room. So it's just there front and center. 
or emailed out, but do things that have like a longevity to them that get people practicing something or challenges, um, you know, to watch your use of such and such over the next month and kind of rate yourself, give, give yourself a, a score. And it's not so we can come back and, and judge what that score is. It's let's look at what's really landing with us and what do we really understand about this and what's chirping us up a little bit, right? Um, and it really is, the center of this really is staying curious. Um, if people give us feedback that, you know, maybe they feel that they're only successfully kind of centering around this kind of work 20% of the time, right? We want to be in reaction and say, well, what's that about? And we want to like raise the gauntlet, right? Let's make sure that we spend some time with curiosity before we do that, all right? Because this is a skill that isn't a set of tricks you practice and then it works. It really isn't. There are some very technical pieces, but some of it is very artful, right? And there's people that are going to kind of assimilate and be able to use this much more easily than others. And then that's not an indication of whether the person is better at their job or not, but this is um, therapeutic work as well. And we do all engage differently from each other with the participants. We all kind of have our own style. And there may be some styles that just kind of, I say like pull this up or able to use this more easily than others. So, you know, when this happens, let's dig in, right? And let's really take a look at what's going on. Without asking those questions and being curious, we could be losing some really great opportunities to support our staff. You know, um, a lot of engagement too. Um, you know, when staff feel supported, especially around initiatives that you've, you know, that there's accountability around it, that they, people are looking at, um, I think we all can agree that person-centered work is, um, and when it becomes part of what we do and a natural part of what we do, our engagement and our relationships with the program participants are so much healthier. Um, and there's so much more trust and mutuality in them that this is worth its weight in gold. The outcomes are better. People stay engaged. The other thing is when you give staff tools, you know, not just another thing to do, but when you're giving these some, supportive tools that help them do their work, we're gonna see staff there that are more engaged and more hopeful and then enjoy coming to work much more every day. But if we're giving all of this and not allowing people to kind of feel the way through it and giving them support by remaining curious about what's not working and why, then people will land on, oh my God, this is just another thing I have to pay attention to. And, and obviously that's not what it's about. You know, that's not where we want it to land. Um, goals. If we've put this and it's landed on a job description, number one, you know, we can't just let it die out until the next year when we're looking at or doing someone's evaluation, right? So if we're putting this standing agenda in our conversations with people, let's have them do some goals around it for their development, you know, and work with them to choose areas or what that's going to look like for them. You know, just like we would with a program participant, you know, work with them to select goals. Let's ask, what do they want to do around this, right? What do you think that they want to achieve? If it has to do with a training goal and an experience goal, you know, what are, your, what are your, the first big steps that you think to make in the next couple months that are going to lead to your comfort or your increase in comfort using this, right? And what is, by the way, comfort going to look like, right? Is it going to say that you can report, you think you do this successfully 20% of the time, you know, 50% of the time? It's the same thing when we're doing recovery plans with people. Let's help them break it down small so they can see the progress. And that, by the way, we can do something that's measurable and really understand if they're achieving their goal. And if not, be able to pinpoint what part of that might be off kilter a bit, because maybe they need to adjust one of the ways they're trying to get to the goal. One of the, it could be an adjustment of one of the objectives or one of the interventions or steps they're taking, right? Just like some of the service planning we're doing. So accountability is not a four letter word. I promise you that, okay? Um, 
I want to do a really quick time check because one of the things that um, we weren't able to do a ton of questions and answers and at the last session. And um, this is an era where people probably have more of them just because we're now walking it all the way through recruitment to onboarding to training and then to follow up. So I wanted to make sure we had at least 15 minutes um, to be able to do that. So I'd like to, I'm going to check the chat and then um, open it up for questions from everybody else. So, okay. Let me take a look and see if anybody has. Oh, okay. Yep. Again, um, as Graciela had said, or Vanessa actually had said that we will um, be sharing the slides and if there's any supporting materials that you wanted me to forward afterwards, obviously I'll be very, very happy to. Um, and it looks like, yeah, it looks like the rest of the chat had to do with slide sharing and whatnot. So I really wanted to open it up to everybody. Um, we do have about 15 minutes. So you could ask questions in the chat if you would like, or simply raise your hand and Vanessa can unmute you. And um, can't, if I don't have the answer to a question, I will guarantee that if there's an answer out there, I could provide it to you. So any questions, anybody? It's a quiet field. I'm going to remain curious about that. Any questions or any comments, people that have tried this that you could share? So thank you, Remy. I really like the presentation. So I think it's very important for who does the listening, participating in this webinar. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. important to understand that um, the process to become a recovery and system starts from the beginning. And I would like just to hear a little bit more about the recruitment process when you hire somebody. So can mm. you just go a little bit more details about the process, the interview, that is the specific questions related to recovery Orient that you are uh, asking at the time of the interview, because you talk a little bit about that, but I would like to share a little bit more. Yeah, so like an example. Yeah. yeah, yeah, please. Well, great. And that's a great question. Thank you. Um, and I'd be happy to, to send along scenarios. I don't have the specific scenarios right in front of me, but we all know like, and I'm going to tell people right away, when you're doing the scenarios, obviously, you're going to have to create ones that make sense for the work, particular work you're doing and the I'm sorry, particular role you may be um, looking to recruit. But in our interviews, um, OK, so we have a format because one of the things we want to make sure is for any particular role, we're asking people the same questions. Right. And it's so easy when you don't have it sitting in front of you to kind of let the interviewee guide the questions you're asking, right? So you get off the interview and you're like, oh, I got no sense of, um, they use the word person-centered a lot and they said they knew what it meant. I didn't ask them to dig in and give me examples, right? So one of the first things you wanna make sure of, for instance, is that your questions, especially centered around this, should be asked or written down. So you're asking everybody the same questions, right? And the same follow-up. If not, we tend to go like this. We know that. The other thing you want to make sure of is if you want time to be able to get to that in an interview, um, we think that just having the questions down ahead of time helps the interviewer guide rather than the interviewee guide. And also make sure that the person we are interviewing is doing the talking. I think one thing we get caught up in is we want people to understand what the work is. So we go into this big entourage or uh, entourage, wrong word. We go into this big montage of this is what we do and this is what we're. it's gonna look like. And we draw this big, beautiful picture. Before we know it, we've talked 85% of the time, right? Throw a couple questions at people and then get off the, either it's the phone because it's been remote lately or leave the interview with as many questions about who that person is as when we started. So my first thing is write them down ask them of everybody. What are particular, what are some of the questions we might ask, right? Is specific, I, I've asked people, what does the word recovery mean? 
What does it mean to you? Then I zip my lip, which isn't easy to do, <laughs> so, and listen. And even if they're fumbling a bit, let them have that moment. And they might fumble. And you might also many times hear from people, they dive right into the, um, the description of recovery that might be solidly founded on substance abuse and use disorders, right? But let them feel through it. You want to know if they don't mention anything about um, that person being, it being a collaborative experience, the person choosing and making choice and all of those components, let it be. You know that about them now. You know where they're sitting with it and maybe what their learning curve would be. So one is ask the question right out about recovery. Ask the person right out, especially after, hopefully when someone has come to you, they've looked at your, I hope it's a good sign that they've looked at your website and really learned about the organization and the history and the mission statement and everything. It's a good sign, right, <laughs> of a good candidate. But um, ask them, okay, so now that you've known a bit about our organization, you've looked at our website, we've chatted a bit. Tell me in your words, what you understand your role to be, you know, at this moment with the information you have. Zzz. Let them talk. If they need to fumble, if there's awkward silence, let's stop rescuing people <laughs> with changing the subject or answering it for them. If they don't know, it's information, right? It's information we need to know. Questions I've also asked, especially when people mention, people say, well, I got, you know, why this work and why this organization, right? Most of the time I say, why, tell me about this work, your interest. Why are you interested in working, whatever, whether it's on our inpatient unit or in our residential program, zip it. Listen. You're going to, people will give you a lot of information if you let them. And some of the information is going to be information where a flag starts to fly a little bit, or, you know, a learning curve is going to be there. And some of the information they give you is going to be useful knowing who they are. Question I ask people, what do you like to do when you're not working? It seems like a really sophomore question. People don't realize that you can glean as such good information or as much information about somebody by asking them what they do when they're not working, because what they do when they're not working tends to show you what their natural skills, talents, and interests are. And then you could see what they're doing outside of here and may, what are the values that that aligns with, right? What skills does that align with, right? Are they doing things that involve other people? Are they doing things that are, um, um, more isolative or alone time. And what is it that they're doing, right? Again, you're going to learn a ton of stuff. The other thing I ask people right out is, so, you know, this is the work we do. We've talked about it a little bit. What do you think our services do? What do you think the outcome we hope for is? And zip it. Let them talk about it. We start to understand from where with people come, what is their level of hope? Right in their what do they really think? Will yeah, that's, come? That, that that's is a very very wonderful uh, information. We have a comment on the chat. Oh, so Ms. Williams said we conduct hiring boards with the pre-established questions. That I yeah. So and I, I love that. Question. Yeah, me too. And then you have a questions that it's want to ask you. What is the best way of creating a person-centered treatment plan? And how would it differ from all the treatment plans? Wonderful question. And I could, also, I could send along some samples, but they're very easy to. Well, <clears throat> Janice Tandora's work and Larry Davidson's work, they've also they've put together um, information or um, samples of very well done um, recovery plans. And normally I'll tell the person like, name it what you want, it's your plan, right? So we all know what it's used for, but um, let me 
let me just kind of break this down. Um, there's a lot of great templates out there. The first thing is there are person-centered treatment plans or individual recovery plan samples out there in abundance that use that language. One is you want to create a plan or if you're creating a template for a plan, the first things you want to make sure are on there are, you know, everybody wants to choose their goals, right? So you want to have an area, obviously, for what is that person's goals. Now, not surviving goals. We can do surviving goals. That's okay. But we want to put a place for thriving goals, right? A surviving goal might look more like they need to pay the rent. I mean, we need to learn, we need to pay our rent and maybe they've had problems with that in the past, right? So sure, you wanna do a goal around how are you gonna make it this time, right? How are you gonna make sure your bills are paid? But let's make sure we put it in a box for what we call our thriving goals, okay? Not just surviving. And I know that sounds really weird, but thriving goals are going beyond staying out of the hospital, keeping our apartment and what our thriving goals are, what do I wanna do that's gonna give me a reason to get out of bed in the morning, right? So parts of your recovery plan should include thriving goals. Um, what is that person's goal in their own words? It should be in their own words. And people always go, oh my God, well, what am I gonna do if they say, I wanna become an airplane pilot, right? And I know they've just come out of a 15 year hospital stay and I don't wanna be in the business of squashing hopes and dreams, but what do I do with that? I say, rock on, that's a great goal, okay. You want to become an airplane pilot. Tell me about what experience you've had with that. And tell me about some, what do you have that'll help you do that? Every treatment plan, every, I'm sorry, recovery plan or individual recovery plan should have a place for, let's start with strengths. Okay, here's your goal. Let's talk about all the things you have in your pocket or in your toolkit right now for being able to achieve that. Well, you know, I am I'm great with, um, I'm not afraid of taking a class. I was a good student. Great, right? Um, I'm not afraid to meet people and try new things. Wonderful. You want to make sure you have a place that talks about all their strengths. And then you're going to talk about, is there anything that's going on right now that you think might trip you up? Because let's make sure we pay attention to that and get it out of the way, right? So in their own words, having a really kind of a goal that's in their own words, before you move on to kind of break that goal, that goal down, you want to make sure you've had a conversation or a place that talks about what are they bringing to the table to be able to do it, what might get in their way. Um, the other thing you want to make sure is, okay, what are the resources you have right now besides us? I mean, we want people to always be looking at what do you have going on naturally in your life? Is it you, you have someone you know that's in the business? You have someone who um, um, you have a great relationship spiritually? that you think will provide you hope and strength. Let's make sure we're bringing all the natural resources that we can. The other thing is, okay, so a person says they wanna work as a pilot and we're working their way through. What is our attitude around that? That's a number one, okay? Are we gonna say, oh, is it your face gonna do that when they say, I wanna be a pilot? My face will light up and go, wow, that is, that's amazing. That's amazing. That to me is a thriving goal, right? All right. That's big, that's amazing, right? It's a big, hairy, audacious goal, but we don't have to say that. Okay, so let's break that down, right? There's many, many, um, there's many, many different steps to be able to achieve this goal. So let's break it down small so we can really look at that carefully. And then before you know it, we'll say, okay, what are the first three big steps you think you have to make in the next three, four months, six months? And they might say, well, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me backtrack a little bit. When they're first doing that goal too, one of the things to be curious about is, okay, great goal, tell me about that. And there's a story um, that's been passed down with someone who really did want to work uh, or say they wanted to become an airplane pilot. And when we got curious about it and said, that's great, that's cool, why? And then zipped it. I always say that a lot, zip it, because it's hard for us to do sometimes. Um, they loved being around airplanes. They thought it was amazing. They were in awe of the way they were able to defy gravity. They loved the sound, the vibration. Great. That's great stuff, right? So you start to understand also, maybe they really do want to be a pilot. Maybe there's something else they want to do 
because they love being around planes, right? The long story short is to work with this person. And it wasn't to guide them away with the goal. It was asking them about that and being curious. It was that it wasn't so much about flying a plane. It was he loved airplanes and wanted to be around airplanes, right? Well, guess what he's doing now? He's working at the airport, helping check people in and at registration by his choice. It wasn't really that he wanted to fly the plane once we listened. Although there are going to be people that really want to fly the plane. And guess what? Help them make their goals small, small, as small as they can be and take the steps they need to take. But how would it differ from other treatment plans? I'll tell you why. One is let's kind of change our language and look at it as, okay, we do treatment. If we're a physician or we're a clinician, um, we know that if they're utilizing medication, they have someone who manages that. They have someone who they get their scripts from um, and they're with us. Let's spend our time going again from treatment goals to thriving goals. So right there, the meaning of that plan is completely different. Let's use person-centered language and work in collaboration. Don't have a treatment plan or something all filled out and they arrive and we go, okay, we're gonna go over this today. I thought of some really cool things. Look, sometimes we do that in goodness of heart, but that's not someone's goal. That's not someone's person-centered plan. Their plan is gonna be in their words. And if we need to qualify or get clarification, about really what that goal means, we can do that. Break it down tiny. You know, I know that we have these, um, have to get something done by when, but we find that when we do our goals and we try to set goals that really, really are looked at and reviewed every 90 days, keep them small. That way that person is experiencing movement because we know that oftentimes movement is, is in increments and small. We also know that recovery is not linear, just like anybody else. Sometimes we take a couple steps back, get a little tripped up, go to the side, recenter ourselves again, right? So it allows people in short periods of time to really experience change and movement, as well as staff too. We count in this, our hope counts, right? Let's keep it small, let's keep it measurable. And it will be different from other plans because the concept we're moving into it or stepping into it with is different. It's not surviving goals, it's surviving. And those plans, believe it or not, do not rub up against a lot of JCO or CARF because you can write them right in there. Look, this is the person's plan that you need for Medicaid billing or whatever. And we have a recovery plan here. And believe it or not, a lot of the things you're looking at and having to write down that would satisfy your funding source or your creditors um, are very much interwoven into what's what someone's survived thriving goal might look like because there are things they need to pay attention to to keep themselves well enough, right? It's, it's not an and or. It really isn't. They can be woven in together. And we could spend an entire day talking on, about how you do that and crafting something that looks more person-centered. So if that's ever something that you're interested in, oh, we could pull up a template and kind of work on it together. So I know we're running out of time here, folks. Um, but there are templates out there. Um, and if you want to search um, re uh, recovery roadmaps, um, really great work that's been done through Yale. Um, and they give you some worksheets that you can actually work on with the program participant or give to them ahead of time to be able to consider things like, geez, what are my strengths? You know, what are my talents? What are my interests? They're worksheets that give, you so, to give them some ways to kind of language it or describe it, which is wonderful stuff. So I get to zip it. <laughs> it's two minutes up. <laughs> oh, Remy, thank you so very much. You are so welcome. Thank you all for your participation in this webinar today. So yeah, I thank saw you, here everybody. they have a suggestion for roundmap training as a webinar. We'll be sure that you address this, this need. And please answer our survey. Remy, thank you so much again. This presentation will be available tomorrow. Please visit the MEHSC New England website. Um, yeah, so I hope to see you here again. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day and have a wonderful week. Great spending time with everybody. Thank you for joining in. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.